So this year I'm going to do a, a behind the scenes of Certant. And I did this, um, I don't know, was it fall? For Steve Pataki at SonicWall. He's a, the chief revenue officer, I believe, at, at SonicWall. And he came in and uh, Mike and Judy and Heidi and everybody gave presentations on what Certant does. And I gave my presentation and he, he said, you know, obviously you guys put this out as a marketing piece to, to customers, right? And we're like, no. And he said, well, you um, put this on your website and you talk to customers about this, all the things that you do behind the scenes when they come on board. And we said, no. And he said, well, you need to do that. So when the CRO at SonicWell tells you that you need to do that, that's uh, probably a good idea. So Mike and Judy you know, asked me to actually speak on this topic uh, at our annual conference. So I'm going to do that. If I can get through all the material, they took my laptop away from me this morning because they knew that normally I'm in the back of the room changing slides. I've been changing slides for you know, the last five days. Um, so I wasn't able to change any more slides. So we'll see how much of this we can get through. But um, before we uh, get started, though, I always like to give things away. And uh, we are going to give away an eight-port PoE Arrowhive switch to Mr. Jeff Ty. Is Jeff here? Where's he at? Jeff, see me after this. You got lucky. We drew your name. You're going to get a free eight-port Arrowhive switch. Um, Arrowhive, you know, is a new product that we picked up. And uh, they were so kind to uh, give us some switches to give away. Um, they're really nice, cloud-managed. Uh, you get three years of licensing with that as well. So. Uh, you can keep it and put it in your, your home office or wherever you want to do it. So we'll get started here. Um, I want to talk about our teams. We have many departments at Certain. Uh, before, it was just one big flat company. You know, everybody did a little bit of everything. So we have a, an admin department. The admin department is Heidi and Roberta, Karen, Alex, Tabby, Gwen. Uh, Gwen's new to the team. But they take care of a lot of the administrative work on the day-to-day. Um, they're doing the billing, they're doing the invoicing, they're giving you phone calls um, to make sure that your subscriptions are you know, staying up and not being expired, which is a big portion of what we do. Um, they do a lot of work behind the scenes. You get to talk to some of them, some of them you don't get to talk to, um, but they're doing a lot of work to help support you and make sure that the um, experience you get with us is the best one available. From a development standpoint, we're almost a completely custom in-house company. Almost every single thing that we do is built in-house. And we do that with um, a team of developers. Uh, prior to probably three, four, five months ago, before Aaron actually joined the team, uh, it was Mike Leninger and Pete DeCicio. They were our development team. They developed everything in-house for us. We're currently actually looking for a junior developer right now as well. Um, so that team's just expanding. We're able to do more things with all of our products. Our IDS platform that I'm going to speak about a little bit. We've made updates on our web portal, our per video cloud reporting engine. All of that is stuff that those guys wrote. I'm very proud of that stuff. Um, our executive assistant, Michelle Beckman, uh, she keeps Mike and I in line a lot of times and does many other things. She you know, does a lot of HR uh, marketing. Um, big applause to Kara Parfit. She basically put all of this on today. Um, Funny story about Carrie is she came to Certain and uh, had no security background at all. I, I'm not certain that she knew how to turn a computer on other than to play on her iPhone. And, um, but she's a fantastic worker, fantastic. And she's held four, five, six different positions in the two and a half, three years that she's worked at Certain. And she takes on every challenge and she does, does a great job. Uh, we have a project coordinator now, Gail Craig. Um, she's new to the team. Um, does a fantastic job, but we do tons of deployments, lots of deployments. And what she does is she coordinates all that conversation between our deployment engineers and the customer, you, to make sure everything's on time, that we're you know, doing everything the customer wants, meeting all the objectives, making sure we close out projects the right way. Technical departments, I'm not going to talk about it, everybody. Um, there's just a lot, of the, a lot of the guys on the team. Uh, we have technical departments now. In 2015, of August of 2015, we were one flat team. Everybody was responsible for everything. There was, some people were responsible for outage remediation, some people were responsible for change control, but we all held that responsibility. So we did that um, as one big group. I went to Mike and Judy and we sat down and we came up with a plan that we actually need to structure the departments to become more efficient to provide better customer service. 
So we did that. So now we have a network security team, we have a network remediation team, we have a network engineering team, we have um, a deployment team. And each one of these teams is uh, responsible for something different. Now, each one of them can inter you know, operate on each side of the, the fence if they want to because we do cross-training. The network security team, if you have our Sentry service, what happens is we take the syslog off of your box, we run it through that in-house IDS system, and we scan it to see if there's uh, botnets on your network, um, anybody's going to an abuse IP address, uh, remote connections coming into your, your network that's not supposed to be, and that team gets those alerts, and they run those alerts down. And we get thousands and thousands of alerts a day. And they run every single one of those down, and if they find out that there's a problem, then they actually shoot you guys a message, um, create a ticket, and they start working that process with you to let you know what they found, how to mitigate that. Network remediation team. Um, for our retail customers, this is really bread and butter for what we do. Um, if an internet connection goes offline, we pick up the phone, we call the location, we call your IT team, we'll even call your ISP and we'll remediate that outage all the way to rolling a truck if we have to change a modem. We take care of that. Um, we're, we're averaging anywhere, you know, we have a little over 5,000 firewalls now. We're doing around about 86, 87 outages on average a day. That might seem high, but I mean, you know, we're dealing with a lot of retail there where it's DSL connections, it's really bad cable connections, and that team is working all of those outages. They do a lot of level one, level two change control as well, content filtering stuff. Um, they do a lot of the auditing that I'll talk about later as well. They're responsible for that. Network engineering team. These are the guys that are going to do the troubleshooting for you. They're the ones that if you call in uh, to the engineering line and you need to add NAT policies, routes, you need help with your MPLS, you're uh, making changes to a web server, these guys are going to take care of this for you. That's, wh that's what they do. Um, high level troubleshooting, they'll do some network architecture as well. Our deployment team. These are our senior most uh, members on our team. Um, our principal engineers on that team, Jeremiah Johnson, uh, he's going to talk later. Uh, Jason Palm, that he's going to do a live hacking session here later as well. He's on that team. Um, they deploy firewalls all day long. They're also the wisdom for our technical staff. And I can't understand, you know, I'm not trying to understate that. Um, these guys are, they're fantastic. Um, they provide a lot to the team. They are um, our buddies, our quote unquote buddies. We have a buddy system. And a lot of people roll up to them. And they just contain a lot of the wisdom of everything that we do. Um, I think each one of them right now is averaging around 19 deployments a month. Um, that's what they're carrying at any single point in time. So that's a lot. So that's where Gail comes into play. She helps them manage those timelines because they want to sit down, they want to pound out configs, they want to have time to talk to you as a customer to do network architecture. Um, so if you're ever in, you know, having a case where you want to do a redesign, but you're not sure what to do, call us up. We'll get one of these guys on the phone with you and they'll help walk you through network architecture, best practices, network segmentation, what we're supposed to be doing. Management team. It's a, it's a homegrown management team. Really, we're a kind of a homegrown company. You know, Mike and I joke around, we're kind of like a farm system of a, of a baseball team that our network uh, remediation team is typically made up of network analysts ones and twos. Okay, pretty entry level people that come in and we, we train them up. When they're trained up, they go to the network engineering team, or they go to the network security team, and we just continue that cycle over and over and over again. That's one of the, the great things about working at CERTIN is the ability to grow. And um, I know that's an important piece for why a lot of uh, employees come over. We've hired eight employees since January 1st. Uh, we're at 50. Our 50th employee actually starts on Monday. We were choking around you know, last night at dinner, like, what should we do? Should balloons fall from the ceiling? Should we get a t-shirt cannon? You know, should sirens and horns go off? You know, 50th employee. But uh, management's a homegrown team as well. Sean Arnold recently promoted to the management um, position on the network remediation team that was previously held by Andrew Leiterman. Both of them started off as entry-level network analysts once. They were on the network remediation team remediating outages just continue to gain knowledge, wisdom, uh, management skills. So we promoted Sean to the network remediation team. We move Andrew Leiterman into a new position, which is really important for all of you, quality assurance and training. We have a full-time quality assurance person now. He QAs work every single day. Um, that's a really big deal to me. Um, customer service, quality that we're doing. Um, 
it, it's right one of the top things for me. I'm very happy. Andrew is a very detail-oriented person, a very analytical person, so he's going to do great in this role. And as a trainer, and I'll hit on this a little bit later, I have a full slide deck about that, um, the training that we do for employees is probably bar none to what other people do these days. Sam Sexton, he came to us um, as having no experience. He was, what was he doing? He was at COSI for, it wasn't MIT support. He wrote grants. Yeah, he wrote grants for COSI. And uh, he just made a decision. It was, you know, nonprofit. He wanted to uh, come over and try IT. He was going to school at the time for it. We gave him a chance as an entry-level network analyst, and he's never looked back. Every, everything we've given him, um, he's taken and run with it. And just as I have done, you know, starting off, I started off as a network analyst as well here. Uh, we fall on our faces, and we pick ourselves up, and we dust ourselves off, and we learn from it, and we keep going. And those guys do a very, very good job of that. This is a biggie for everybody in this room. Some of you know this, some of you do not. We now have an actual escalations person for technical problems. It's Anthony um, on our team. Um, Anthony's been with us for four and a half years now. He came to us as an 18-year-old right out of discharge, medically discharged from the military. Super, super smart kid. Um, I think that Mike and I lost many nights sleep and a lot of hair over him as an 18-year-old. Uh, but. Uh, he has hung around and he is uh, a very bright individual, so he handles every one of our escalations. So if you call in and you're working with an engineer and it becomes a, a large problem and we're not maybe, maybe making any headway, um, it goes to Anthony and Anthony takes care of it. And Anthony's going to take care of it. He knows what to do. Um, if he can't take care of it, he knows the proper people to call or to go get to take care of it. Um, this has actually worked out very well for us. It's been in play now for probably about two and a half months. And I think at that point in time, I think I looked yesterday, we've had nine escalations and every single one of them he's been able to take care of. Um, if you get a chance uh, and you want to talk to me more about the escalations process, it's fantastic. We also now have a single person to talk to SonicWall whenever we have a problem. Anthony knows all the people to get in touch with at SonicWall if we need to escalate something, if we find a bug. Um, Anthony takes care of that. We have a full process where we track all of that. Uh, in a smart sheet project management um, so we can see exactly what's going on with that. This is uh, one of the things that I'm really, really excited about um, in 2018. Remote workers. We're actually all over the place. Um, Andrew White lives in Oregon. Chance, um, Arizona, Eric Richards in New Hampshire, Josh Evans in Cleveland. Um, we, we typically try to hire really good people. You know, and I would say that we have a fantastic team right now, so we don't put the um, handcuffs of somebody on a desk if they need to go someplace, they want to move. We would like to do what we can to keep them. Andrew White is that, it is a really good example of that. He wanted to move to Portland to uh, pursue a music career, and, uh, but he wanted to keep this job. So we work with him, and he actually works um, full time, five days a week from Oregon, and uh, he's traveling with his band here in a couple months. Chance came, from, came to us from SonicWall. Um, we stole him away from SonicWall, and he wanted to stay in Arizona. He didn't want to move to, to Dublin, although when you talk to him when it's 115 degrees in Arizona, he's like, hey, when can I come to Dublin for a week because I need to get out of the heat? Um, but he stays out in Arizona. Eric Richards was uh, somebody he worked in the office for us for about a year and a half, and he has family in New Hampshire, wanted to move to New Hampshire, so he packed up and he went to New Hampshire. And Josh Evans is a talented engineer that was in Cleveland. He really didn't want to move. So we uh, struck up an agreement, and he comes to the office uh, once a quarter, and he works remotely out of his house in Cleveland, does a great job. We have uh, technical support representatives now. Not sure if anybody knows that or not, but we run a part-time team of technical support representatives, which is like another part of our farm system. We're growing talented individuals. Um, Seth Ramirez, he actually applied for an engineering position um, for us, and he was just, I think, a year into college for electrical engineering. And we're, you know, we're looking for people that have four or six years experience at that point in time, but we set him down and talked to him, super bright kid, and now he's a part-time TSR for us. He's going to school to finish his degree um, in IT. Rachel King, first intern that we've ever had, and she's worked out fantastic. 
Uh, I think it was about two years ago I struck up a partnership with Harrison College um, and Reynoldsburg um, ESET to do an internship. And we brought Rachel on. She was going to high school at the time, but she was also taking classes uh, for IT. Brought her on as an intern, super, super smart. And she wanted to stay on, so now she's at Columbus State. She works part-time for us as a, as a technical support representative. And hopefully, the goal is to help get her through college and then bring her on full-time at some point in time. So that's just some people that's, you know, the team. I think it's important that uh, you get to know who's doing the work behind the scenes. It's, it's important for me that, you know, they get some recognition. I wanted you to know all the people that do that as well. We push a lot of education at certain. Maybe not so much, you know, formal education, the, the means of going to school and getting a degree. Um, although Roger Newton, I don't think that Roger made it over here for this one, but uh, he just got his bachelor's degree, just graduated with his bachelor's degree in information technology. But here's some certifications that we have on staff that I'm really proud of, and I know that Mike is as well. We have 25 CSSAs on staff. Uh, at one point in time, I do not know if this is still true, we had more certified SonicWall administrators in the U.S. in one building than SonicWall had themselves. Um, 12 CSSPs. We have four uh, certified SonicWall sales engineers actually on staff as well. And this is another big one for me. We have four CISSPs um, on staff. I personally am one. I know what it takes to go through that. It was not easy. Um, our principal engineer, Jeremiah Johnson, um, is uh, certified as well. Kevin Roberts is here too, mingling around somewhere. He just passed his CISSP. And Andrew Leiterman did as well this year. And um, they came to me. They both made the mistake. They came to me and said, hey, you know, what's kind of next for me? What should I be doing? And I said, get your CISSP. And they were like, that was not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> and I said, well, that's, that's the next step. Like I, to me personally, that's kind of the holy grail uh, for people and what we're doing. And I, I just looked at them and told them that. And I think that they're thankful that they went through the pain now for doing it. But it is a lot of work to do that. We also have uh, three certified ethical hackers on staff. This is awesome. It, it really allows us to leverage um, the knowledge that they have to help provide better customer service for you when things are going on. It allows us to configure the firewalls better. It allows us to give you better information on what you're supposed to be doing on your network. Uh, you know, we have nine people that have Network Plus, nine Security Plus, 14 people that are um, certified to deploy and support silence. And we have multiple CCNAs, CCNTs, all kinds of stuff. But these were the big ones that I want to make sure that you understand that the people that are supporting you on a day in, day out basis, they're not, you know, it's not just homegrown talent or they're not just, you know, reading it in a book. They're going out and they're getting these certifications. They're doing their due diligence so we can provide the best customer service possible for you. Behind the scenes, some things have changed. We're at, we've always been 24 by 7, 365, but at 6 o'clock when we went home, one of us carried a pager. And for years, I actually carried a pager. And everybody would always be like, are you a doctor? And I'm like, yeah, I'm a doctor. No. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, now we get SMS to our cell phones. But we are 24 by 7, 365 staffed. Our phones ring um, 8 to 6 Eastern time, but we always have somebody working not by a pager, they're sitting at their desk, they're actually working 24-7, 365. And we do that with a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. They rotate on, they're two days on, two days off, three days on. Um, they work every other weekend. Those guys love those shifts. It's been fantastic for us. Because now, what used to happen is, even myself, I would carry a pager, I would work eight to six, you might get four, five, six pages because somebody needed to do something West Coast time or one of you had an emergency and I would take care of that and then I would get up the next day and I would come, I would come to work. Now that doesn't happen. Now there's always somebody working. There's somebody you can get a hold of very quickly to do those things. And also they take care of all the stuff that comes in overnight. So when we come in in the morning, the, you know, the 8 a.m. staff doesn't have all this work that all of a sudden just gets dumped on their plate. The people that are working at night are already taking care of that for us and can handle the problems. And this has been a great addition. Sentry service. Let's talk about our service levels a little bit. Sentry is our top-notch, highest-rated service, and I would beg all of you to take it because it's excellent. It's 24 by 7 unlimited support. That means if you need help at any point in time, any day of the week, 
you can call in and get a hold of us and we'll actually provide customer support for you. Proactive outage remediation, what does that mean? We're monitoring all of your internet connections and if it goes down, we call you and let you know that it goes down. We take care of that. We'll send you an auto automated uh, notification as well. We'll also call the ISP if you would like us to do that. A lot of you have given us your account information, put us, you on, put us on the accounts, so we can call AT&T and have them let us know what's going on your lines if need be. For video reporting, again, I touched on this a little bit before, but we have our own cloud-based reporting engine that we built, um, that we take all the syslog off, make it look real fancy, and you can log into our mycertain.com web portal, run your reports, you can schedule those reports. You can do what we call our Monday morning coffee reports. You can have your top bandwidth users, top applications, top websites delivered to you at 8 a.m. in the morning if you wanted to on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever day. Automated nightly uh, configuration backups, we do that. Every night we log into your firewall, we back up your firewall configuration, and we store it. We then roll that up. We keep a copy online for 30 days. We roll that up to a monthly. We keep that online for a year. So if any point in time during the year you want to go back a firewall configuration, we can do that. If your firewall dies and we have to ship you a brand new one overnight, it's coming with the configuration file on it because we have the ability to do that because we're backing that up. It's, it's saved customers many, many times because we do this. It's saved us many, many times because we have this. Um, weekly TSR security auditing. We do that as well. We pull back the TSR off of everybody's uh, firewall, the technical support report. We pull it back. Every week we audit that to see if anybody's made any major security changes that are outside of our best practices. If you have, we investigate why you've done it. We have a conversation with the customer and we try to fix it. We do that. Um, you also have access to our security portal, which is the mycertain.com, where you can put in service tickets. Um, you can run your uh, per video reports. You can see the uptime of all your devices. And the big part of Sentry is our certain intrusion detection system. Again, that's where we take all your syslog. It runs through our in-house IDS system. Um, the, the network security team takes a look at it, pushes out tons and tons of alerts to customers. I'll touch more on that in a little bit. Standard. It's just a reduced version of Sentry. It's 8 by 6 unlimited support. You get per video. Um, you do not get the IDS system. You get the backups. You get the TSR auditing. You still get access to mystudent.com. Um, it's still a fantastic service. It still comes to the same group of people. You're just not getting anything from a security basis from us. And I would ask all of you to, to take a look at that. If you're not using Sentry, please take a look at it. We'd love to have a conversation with you. We do offer per, per video as a standalone. We have some K through 12 large schools that do this where they just want to send all their data to us so they can have nice fancy reports. So you do have the option to do that as well. That's what our per video is. Toll-free numbers, we have two of them. You can call Network Remediation, 866-896-6385. Um, and that will be anybody on the Network Analyst team. They'll handle all your outages for you. That's what they do. Uh, then our engineering team, um, troubleshooting, change control, call that number. Audits. We do lots of audits. And uh, I think this is kind of what blew Steve away a little bit when I was talking to him in the fall. You know, we pull back those TSRs off of people's firewalls and we're auditing it to see what's happening, but then we have a team that's auditing the people that's auditing those. We're, we're heavy on that because we want to make sure things are going right. Subscriptions. We audit all of your firewalls. Um, well, I guess we don't. Heidi's team audits the firewalls to make sure that subscriptions are up to date. That's important because if your subscriptions aren't up to date, then you're not getting your um, CGSS, you're not getting your, your gateway antivirus, your IPS. It's not running on the box. You're really not scanning anything at that point in time. It's a big deal to us to make sure that that stuff is turned on. So we audit those subscriptions to make sure nothing's you know, out of bounds. And I think it's 60, 90 days we start reaching out to customers to let them know that renewals, renewals are coming up and we can help you with that. Sonicwall authentications. Uh, we have a couple guys on the team that every morning we get a report of all the Sonicwall offs that happened the day before. And they go through and they audit every single one of those to see what's going on. And they want to see if anybody's maliciously trying to get into a firewall. A lot of times what will happen is we'll bring on a new customer and we'll say, hey, we want to block down management. And they're like, no, 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 no you, you can't do that. I want to be able to get to my firewall. Well, we can you know, get you other ways. Nope, leave it wide open. It's typically on day two when we send them a report of the Chinese and the Russian Federation that's pounding away on their firewall trying to log in. It's when they allow us to lock it down. But they audit this report every day to see who's trying to get in and out of firewalls. And we can provide that information to customers so we know 
that only the good people are logging into these firewalls. Firewall backups, we do those firewall backups every night, but what good is a backup if it's not really there? You know, Mike kind of touched on that. We audit those backups to see what ones failed, um, to see if they're good or not. We have an entire team of guys that actually do that as well. We audit all that stuff. High availability, if anybody has a high availability, a failover box, um, we're monitoring to see whether those boxes are failing back and forth. And we have the ability to let the customer know if they're failing over or not. And we can look into why it failed over, get it back on the primary box if you want to. Device outages. So we monitor all these appliances for up and down time. Uh, we monitor them for problematic state as well. We have an administrative report that runs that the team takes a look at so we can be proactive for somebody who might have an issue. Um, if we didn't have this, and we, we didn't have this years ago, what would happen is we would do our job, but you know, a store would go offline on a Monday, it would go offline on a Tuesday, it would go offline on a Wednesday, it would go offline on a Thursday, and it would do that for about 10 days. And every time we did our job, we called, we got them back online. We called, we got them back online. But you can see there's a problem happening there. It's continuously happening, so there's a larger problem. This report actually allows us to identify that stuff to fix those problems much quicker. So we get a, a list of outages that are continuously happening, how many days, we can go in and we can audit that and take care of that for customers. How many calls are we taking? How much work is certain actually doing? This is pretty amazing to me with the team that we have. Inbound phone calls in March, over 1,400 phone calls. Our hold time was, if you had hold time, was an average of 45 seconds. In March, um, our longest hold time, I think, was like three minutes something was in March. Um, for a support organization, I can tell you those numbers you know, are, are really unheard of. April, um, a little uptick in calls. Average hold time actually went down. So, pretty impressive numbers. The guys actually, uh, uh, we have a phone system where you can see the leaderboard. And they, and they joke around about who's getting the championship belt. It's funny, it's almost like a competition, who can answer the most phone calls every single day. They're always looking at the leaderboard and seeing who's getting the championship belt before they go home at night. Um, workflow process, service tickets. So you guys go to the uh, web portal, you put in a service ticket. What happens? I can tell you in typical support organizations what happens is it goes into a queue and every engineer is responsible for going and grabbing tickets whenever they deem that they have time to do that. Highly inefficient because I as an engineer could grab a ticket that I have no knowledge of how to fix that but now it's my ticket and I need to work on it and try to figure it out. We don't do that at certain. What happens is a uh, service ticket gets entered, uh, it goes to a manager. The manager accepts it and reviews it. Um, we look for a plethora of things that we're doing. They're analyzing multiple factors. Who's the customer? Has anybody on the engineering staff worked with that customer recently? Is there an open ticket? And is, uh, is Kevin Roberts currently working with somebody on that ticket? Well, there's no reason if Kevin's working with a customer on another you know, issue to give another engineer a ticket because then they're just competing for that customer's time and they're competing to get in and out of that firewall. Uh, what's the size of the device? How large of a firewall is it? What type is it? Um, what's the request urgency? Is it, is it, is it right now? Um, service category, is it um, content filter? Is it a route? Is somebody having a problem with MPLS? We take all of this stuff um, into account and then they hand it out to the right person. Why is that important? Because it goes to the person that has the knowledge and has the time to fix your problem as quickly as possible. That's very important to me. I know it's important to almost everybody on our staff that we do that. And I feel like that's the reason why we're highly efficient. And I feel like that's the reason why we're able to give the customer service that we do. I keep hitting on customer service. It's very, very important to me. When you start working at a company that's four people when you start, and you see it grow to 50, and what, this year's the first year we've ever spent money on marketing? <laughs> right? You know, it was grown out of reputation, us giving good customer service. It's very important to me. It's very important to everybody else. We're a customer service company that leverages IT. We're not an IT company that then adds on some type of customer service. And I hope everybody understands that and gets a really good customer service experience with us. So we put a lot of this stuff in to make sure we're giving good customer service. Certain University. This is an idea I had for a really long time and it was a folder out there on our file share and I would put stuff out there but it never really came to fruition. Well, it's coming to fruition. Um, with Andrew Leiterman being our training manager, it takes the training aspect away from myself, 
although I still like to train and, and I still help do that, and from other people where we'd kind of just lock ourselves in a room and we train somebody one-on-one -on -one for a while and then hope that they got it. We've, we're starting to put in a whole plethora of things that we're doing. Currently, right now, each manager is required to give at least one hour of training to employees every single week while at work. Every week they have to give that training. And that training can be about um, sonic wall, it could be about silence, it could be about wireless, it could be about any of that stuff, but they're required to do at least an hour's worth of training every week. So we have three managers now, so that's three hours of training. Um, they can break that up into 30 minute segments if they want to, so they can hit more people, but there's always at least two people in those trainings as well. So you can see we're getting continuous training. We're continuously getting that knowledge built up on our staff. Um, every week, every employee on our technical staff has to provide written documentation, a short summary of two new items that they learned that week. It has to be turned in on a Friday. Every week they do that. Every single week you have to go learn two new things. That could be a knowledge base article, that could be an article out of a security magazine that you read, that could be something that you're doing in the lab. But you have to be able to provide those articles to your manager weekly. We're just trying to continue to grow the knowledge. Weekly trainings. With Andrew now being the training manager, there are going to be set times where people are getting training every week. Every week you're going to be able to get on a training calendar to get that information. Maybe you're new to the company like Raymond. You know, Raymond's new to the company, started this week. He's getting a lot of training now, but let's say a month from now, there's still going to be a lot of stuff that he doesn't know. He can put himself on a training schedule and go in and start to learn about DPI SSL. Because you can't expect somebody to walk through the door and know everything. So this training is very, very important to us. We do monthly quizzes. Every month we give each technical employee a 10 to 15 question quiz. And we grade them to see how they're doing. If they don't get a 90% or higher on that, they're required to take that quiz plus the other quiz the next month. And they can't move on to the third quiz until they get, you know, they get the first quiz at a 90% or higher. It's important for us to make sure that if we're putting you in a training class and we're taking the time to train you while you're being paid for it inside your 40 hour work week, that you're learning that information. And that way you can put it to use for you, our customers. We have a dedicated lab. We actually have kind of two dedicated labs. One's pretty much for deployment. Uh, probably the largest rack of SonicWall equipment that anybody's seen in one place other than SonicWall itself. Then we also have a dedicated training lab as well, where we have firewalls, we have desktops set up in there, um, switches. We have a whole environment. We actually have a quote unquote training company in mystudent.com where if you're that lucky employee, you might get a service ticket sent to you from that training company that's asking you to do something. If, if that company sends you something and you're required to do it, you have to log into those training firewalls and put that in there. Then Andrew does QA work to see how you handled that service ticket. How timely was it? Did you do an appropriate update in the service ticket? How was your training done? Um, you know, sorry, I'll back up a little bit. Did you get proper training before you actually did that instance of the service ticket? We QA all that stuff. Um, we create custom labs for each employee. So if we know that you're weak in an area, we're, we're creating custom labs for you to actually work on that stuff. You can have dedicated time in the lab to do that. Um, so if you're weak on routes and MPLS and you're really not sure what to do, uh, we'll create custom labs for you to go sit in that lab with a trainer or by yourself to complete those. You turn those back over to Andrew. He does quality assurance checking on them. Um, he sees what you're good at, what you're not at. We then start building more custom labs around where we can find your weak areas. It's just a continuous learning process trying to build up our team to support you. How does this all come about? Your annual quiz. Every year you get an annual quiz that you have to show how much knowledge you have based off of all the questions that you had on the quizzes prior. Um, we're working on a platform called Moodle. Somebody in probably K through 12 or universities might know what it is, but it's an online uh, platform that we can use where we can cre create questions and banks of questions and we can pull those out. So we're working on this. It's not all complete, but I want to give everybody a kind of a picture of, of what we're doing here. Because, you know, if I, I take this for granted because I'm working in it day to day and I know what I'm, we're trying to build to provide best from, better customer service, but now I think it's important that you know all the work and effort that we're doing every single day to try to make sure that this technical staff is the best technical staff possible for customer service and answering your questions. 
Service expansion. Been a big year for us, uh, probably last year going into this year, Mike talked about it. Um, for 16 years, we were basically a firewall company. We did, we did SonicWall. Um, and that's all we did, and I, I feel like we did a really, really great job at it. But at some point in time, it's like, man, you kind of want to do something more. Pro somewhere along the line, we started doing email security. Um, some of you might remember Postini uh, back in the day, then Google bought them. But uh, we did Postini for a few customers, and we never really marketed anything to anybody because it was kind of more, hey, we like your customer service. You guys give great support. Would you support this product for us? Sure, why not? Uh, well, now we actually do full-blown email security uh, for, with SonicWall through the SA product, or we do it through Proofpoint cloud product. The Proofpoint product is a great, great product uh, for cloud email security. We use it. We have multiple customers that do it as well. Um, they have a one-touch send secure email uh, function that you can build right into your Outlook. It's just a single button. Um, fantastic feature. If anybody wants to talk to me about it, I would love to talk to you more about it. I had a couple people hit me up. Uh, last night to talk to me about it. Um, Proofpoint um, Essentials is what we use and we support. Great product. Endpoint security, silence. So I think, well, Jeremiah, what was it? Three years ago, two and a half years ago, we saw silence. Three years ago, uh, we saw silence at a security conference and we actually stumbled into it by accident. Uh, they said artificial intelligence, so we're like, oh, this is cool, right? We had no idea that it was actually AV. Once we got in there, like, ah, we don't really care about AV because we don't do AV and AV really doesn't work. Well, this guy put a laptop up there and he had two laptops side by side. One had uh, Symantec, one had Silence, and he threw a thumb drive on both of them and dragged the files to the desktop. And Symantec kept running and then all of a sudden it was brick because it was owned by the malware that he created. And Silence, before you finished dragging it to the desktop, had picked it off and we're like, what just happened? And we're looking at each other like, we got to get our hands on this. And it took us like six months to get our hands on it. So I finally started talking to Mike about it. We kept going through the process, going through the process, and here we are today. We support thousands of nodes of silence. And um, it's, it's a fantastic product. It blows normal, traditional AV away. You know, Mike said that traditional AV is you know, 60, 40% effective. The, the real truth is that if you ask any security expert, they'll tell you that traditional AV is less than 1% effective in the world today that we live in. It's just not effective at all. And Symantec's own CEO at the time says that it's basically dead. When Symantec at the time was the largest AV provider, sig signature base, tells you that the product's dead, that should tell everybody that it's dead. Wireless. Uh, we support wireless, always have, but that's been through uh, the Sonic Points. We're pretty much the go-to people for making Sonic Points work in any environment. Um, I lost a lot of hair over making um, SonicWall wireless work, uh, but figured out how to do it, and actually it was just learning wireless in, in general. I, I feel like a lot of people think you should just be able to plug an access point in and it's going to work. It really doesn't work that way. Um, I thought it worked that way. Even our old site surveys, we'd plug in you know, access points and walk away around with a laptop until you couldn't ping it anymore, and then you knew you needed to put another access point in. Um, there's a better way to do that. We, we learned that, you know, we learned that a long time ago, there's a better way to do it. But, that's how everybody was doing it at the time. I'd ask somebody, hey, how do you do a site survey? Well, I'd, I plug an access point in, I put a ping to the AP, and I just take off walking. When it stops pinging, I know I need to put another access point out there. We have a much better way to do that, and I'll show you that here in a minute. But we picked up the Arrowhive product. This product is fantastic. One of the best features to me, and I, Sam's not here, but he's, the, he's really taken over the reins for me as being the Arrowhive guru, but you have the ability to tell when people can and can't connect. So whether you understand this or not, so if I'm on my iPhone, which really doesn't give a very good signal, and I connect to an access point, and I'm the worst signal guy, I, I'm messing it up for everybody else in this room, okay? You all get slow signal because of me. With, uh, with the Arrowhive, what you can do is you can actually set the DBM to where only certain people can connect. So you have to be pretty close or have good power to be able to connect to it. That's what Arrowhive provides you. Uh, they provide you a lot of analytics as well. You can do a lot of analytics to see who's connecting, uh, beacon rates, all kinds of stuff. Really, really cool technology. We are supporting and deploying that. Cloud managed switching. We just keep adding stuff to the portfolio. And as you can see, it's just going to be a big circle of things we do here. Um, we kind of got turned on to this because of uh, an issue that we had in retail where we would call in for troubleshooting and they'd unplugged all the cables and then plugged it back in, but nobody knew where it went. Well, 
we started investigating with the cloud managed switch, what we can do is we can see all this in a dashboard out in the cloud, and we can turn on port security. So in a POS environment, we can actually have people plug in their POS stations. We can lock those ports down. Now nothing else can get plugged into it. So if somebody walks in, tries to plug something into the switch, it won't work um, because it doesn't know what the MAC address is. And now we have the ability to manage thousands and thousands of switches via a cloud console. This is big for K through 12 university as well because if you want to add a VLAN to your network, you no longer have to log into every single switch of the hundreds of switches that you have. You can log in one place, add that VLAN, push it across to all the switches. Um, Jeff, hope you enjoy your, your switch, buddy. If you need help with it, you let me know. Um, RSS 2.0, this won't be for everybody in the room. This will be for some of you in the room. We have a new retail solution. We partner with a company called Sickage, used to be 403 Labs. We provide end-to-end -end PCI compliance for people now partnering with uh, Sickage. We can do your external vulnerability scans, internal vulnerability scans. We can have you set up with pen testing. We can get you a qualified QSA. Um, this has been really big for us, to be able to add a full-on retail package for our retail customers. Now we can deliver that. Now we're just not the firewall company, the endpoint company. Now we can deliver you almost a complete full PCI compliance package by leveraging Sickage and everything that we do as a company. Enhanced IDS platform, Sentry. I talked about this, but over the course of the last 10, 12 months, we've made a lot of upgrades to our Sentry platform. Uh, we have the ability now that uh, whenever the syslog data comes in, we have all these different categories that the team's looking at. And one of those categories is remote connections. And we break that out into foreign and US. So if we, have, if we see immediately that somebody's trying to connect inbound to your network via a foreign IP address, it flags the ticket, and we immediately start working on that as a high priority event. Uh, botnet, the, the firewall has the ability to block botnet. Uh, we have the ability now to pick that up, look to see what's going on in the network, see if it's uh, realistic or not, see if it's an ongoing bot by the timestamps and how many events that we're getting in, a, in an update refresh cycle. And then we can look out to you guys, send you service tickets, and let you know that maybe there's a potential botnet on your network. There were fit, over 53,000 botnets um, as part of the Verizon report last year. So a lot of botnets out there. Probably the really big one um, that I was most excited about because I beat Mike over the head about it for years, and he just, he, it takes a lot of time to do this, was the IP reputation database. So what we're doing is we're taking 8 to 12 of the most well-known abuse databases in the world putting that into our system, and then we're taking all the syslog that comes off your firewall, and we're matching up that traffic against those databases. So now, if somebody on your network goes to a website that's on one of these abuse sites, it immediately flags a service ticket, and we start investigating to see what it is. Um, this has been really, really big for us. From a standpoint of IDS, just to show the impact of what all these changes have done for the Century Service, in 2016, we opened 1,517 cases from an IDS standpoint. That means that the security team actually opened that many cases with customers. Now, we took thousands of events, but these were cases that we knew without a shadow of a doubt there was probably an issue going on. In 2017, with this coming into the end of 2017, we opened up over 5,700 cases with customers. And we're on pace to double that number in 2018, just because of the information that we're able to get now from these abuse databases. Another really cool feature that I was allowed to squeeze into the IDS platform is we have a certain abuse database system. So if you send me an IP address and you say, hey, I think that this might be bad, or we read it in a news article, we can actually throw it into the abuse database ad hoc. It'll start scanning every firewall that's sending data, and we can see if somebody's got this brand new attack to see if it's happening or not. We were able to notify and help a lot of customers when the well-known app CC Cleaner actually had a problem and one of the versions had an issue. We, were, you, we figured out what the IP address was. We were able to take that IP address, throw it into the IDS system, started scanning the data, and we were able to notify over 12 customers that had the malicious version of CC Cleaner installed on their network, and they would have never known it. We were able to do that with the new IDS system, and that's a big part of the development team. Wireless. So this is a wireless heat map. You know, we're, we're really big into wireless. Uh, we love it. 
predictive analysis. You know, I joked around and was being honest, though, about walking around with my laptop pinging it until, you know, so we don't do that anymore. We can do a remote wireless predictive survey if you can just give us your blueprint. And within 95% accuracy, if I can work with the maintenance person, I can tell you exactly how many access points you need and where they need to go. You don't need to send us on site. We did this work. This is a heat map. This building right here itself, I think, is, this one was 350,000 square feet that we did. This company, before we got involved, had spent over $250,000 in three years trying to get their wireless to work. And this was before we were actually selling wireless as a service. I was just doing this uh, heat mapping technology kind of to help people get their wireless working better. They could not get it to work. They were getting ready to rip out all their sonic points. So um, a Dell account uh, person um, got in touch with, I think, Todd Barrett, our VP of sales, wanted to know if we could help. So I started having a conversation with them, and I said, give me your blueprints, and we'll, we'll work together on this. Within six days, we had all their wireless working, and they said it was the first time they had full wireless in that warehouse and office in over three years. And we were able to do that without ever stepping foot on site, and they had paid people for over two years to come on site and spend over $250,000 doing that. And I can tell you, we charge nowhere near $250,000 to do that unless you will pay us $250,000 to do that, and then we will gladly accept that. But I say this because the importance with wireless, and I'm hoping that we're, you know, some of you are going to get bigger into it. As Mike said, uh, I think Cisco estimates by 20, it's 2026, less than 10% of all networks in any business will be wired. So everything's going wireless. The good part about wireless is no cables. The bad part is when it breaks, it breaks, and it breaks for everybody. So if you're going to deploy wireless, you need to do an analysis and a survey if you want to have it done right. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, if I have an office like this and there's just cubicles, do I need to do one? Probably not, as long as it's under two, 3,000 square feet. But if you have any offices at all, a conference room where you want to put stuff in, or it's over three or 4,000 square feet, you need to have a, a survey done like this. So you know exactly where to put your APs. You can plan for capacity to see how many people are going to be on an AP at any given point in time. And you can put them in an area where you're going to get uh, the best signal and coverage. I'm going to have to fly through this. but um, I'm a big fan of the uh, breach report from Verizon. Uh, and I'm sure Dimitri is going to talk about the, uh, the Sonicwell one. So I, I never put anything in mind about the Sonicwell when I talk about the Verizon one. But this is the, the best well-known. It's the 11th annual. Uh, Verizon report. Um, over 53,000 uh, incidents occurred, uh, over 2,000 breaches, 43,000 uh, botnets, a lot of bad stuff happening in the world last year. Difference between an incident and a, and a breach is, you know, an incident, we're just saying that we, we know probably something happened to the CIA in our, in, our, in our environment, but we're not confirming that it did. We don't know what happened. We not sure that we lost any of that data. A breach is we know for sure something happened. We know that we lost data. Somebody took a system offline. We know that happened. Um, we'll just go through some of these. Who's behind all the breaches? 73% are outsiders. Um, does anybody know what the main reason is for people trying to break in? What is their motivation? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody? Anybody? Well, that was people from certain. You can't answer this question. But yeah, it's, it's financial gain. That's number one. Um, it's big business now. It's organized crime. It's no longer the kid sitting in the basement, you know, hacking away, wanting to see if he can make his buddy's CD drive pop in and out, right? They want to, uh, and I say that knowing that I used to do that, but... Um, uh, people want money out of this. It's, it's large, organized crime that's doing this. Um, most of the stuff's hacking. Uh, a lot of it includes malware. Does anybody know the percentage of, just a, a guess, of malware that's delivered by email? And I told two people this last night, so I'll be disappointed if they don't remember this number. <laughs> What's the number, Dave? <laughs> remember this. He's put his head down, but it's okay. Anybody else got a guess? I'll give you something if you get it, you get the closest. Anybody else? It's, 90, it's 93%. 
93%. Did you say 95? All right. You're get, you get a switch. Make sure you see care. We'll give you a free switch. 93% of all malware that's delivered is delivered via email. That's the reason why, to me, the proof point stuff, the email security uh, from SonicWall is so important. Uh, we have customers that are actually taking uh, proof point, putting it in the cloud, scanning that email, dropping it off to an ESA box, which is a SonicWall hardware appliance on site, so they can run the capture technology that Jeremiah and Dimitri will talk about later. So they have dual scanning um, because email is such uh, a threat vector for everybody. Um, a lot of privilege misuse still. That means that people just aren't doing a very good job of checking the credentials um, of their own network, knowing what people are doing. Do you have anything set up at your organization to watch logins, to track employees, to see what they're doing? Why did somebody um, in marketing get access to the employee uh, background information? They don't need that access. Do you have the ability to do that? If not, you, you need to have the ability and be doing that. Uh, who are the, vi the victims? Uh, healthcare, typically pretty big because of all the, the records that are there. Retail is obviously a big one. Uh, the bottom part of this one, though, right here, the 58%, probably hits home to almost every single person in this room, or the majority of you. 58% of the victims are small business. That's us, small business. They're, they're not going after the, the super large organizations. They're going after small business. They're going after low-hanging fruit. It's almost like you walk up to the door and you shake the door handle. Is it locked? If it is, they probably just walk away because they don't want to try that hard. They just want to go through the front door. 76% um, of the breaches were financially motivated. It goes back to um, money. We want money. This is a, this is a sad one, too. 68% of the breaches took months or longer to discover. Typically, a breach, once, so a breach is only a breach once you actually discover it, right? So once it's discovered there's a breach, once they go back in the timeline, typically that breach only took minutes for it to occur. That's a little misleading because nobody actually knows how long it took them before the breach to get all the information, but the breach itself, it's typically like that, and they're in and off to the races they go. Um, actors involved in the breaches, um, typically external, internal still hovering around, you know, 30, 35%. As you can see, financials way up here. And then espionage um, is almost always second. It's almost always financial, and it's always espionage on large companies looking for um, corporate information. Hacking, number one, malware, number two. You know, it got there for a while where malware kind of got close to hacking. Um, you know, hacking is I'm going to, you know, see if you left a default username and password on your routers or your firewalls. Can I guess your, um, can I guess your passwords? Does anybody know the amount of money that it takes to get an employee's credentials? If you just offered them cash money, what's the average amount of money that an employee would say they need before they will give you their credentials? Knowing what would happen to them if it, they found out. Thousand dollars? So, so the number has grown since last year. I am happy to tell you that. Last year it was one hundred and five dollars. This year it's an amazing one hundred and twenty-seven dollars for somebody to give up their credentials. So, you said hundred dollars. You'll get a switch too. Did you, did you say hundred? No, you'll get a switch too. Hey. I'm just giving stuff away. <laughs> you get a switch too. Everybody, no, no, no I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm not going full Oprah on anybody up here. <laughs> um, this one's a little bit hard to see because there's just so much information, but it gives you the different uh, actions that are in the breaches and in, uh, incidents, um, hacking, loss. It's just air, you know. You see this all the time. Somebody um, threw away a laptop in the government, or they threw away files, didn't think anything about it. The old copier mistake, where they sell their copiers, and they had the hard drive in them, and nobody forgot to you know, take the hard drive out, and now all the data's in there. Um, organized crime, number one. Internal actor, us, 
system admin, right? And that doesn't, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the system admin did the breach. It just means that they probably got the system admin credentials somehow, and that's how they did the breach. So it's not that the system admin was actually doing something wrong um, or being malicious, but that's how. And then the end user, the end user um, social engineering. Calling up, saying that you are a customer that, um, that's not really a customer, saying that you need some help, getting accounting information, things like that. Um, top assets, database, POS terminal, POS controller. POS stuff's always gonna be close to the top, necessarily with the database too, because that goes along with the, anything retail-wise, retail's always hit very largely. Um, the big issue with POS, the reason why you see POS is almost always on here, if you go back through the years, is because most people in retail still allow email to be delivered to the POS terminal. You should never allow that to happen. There should, the POS terminal is the POS terminal. Um, they should not be allowed to get uh, email on those critical systems because again, 93% of all malware is delivered via email. Um, it's taking seconds to minutes for compromise but months for discovery. I kind of touched base on that, but I mean really that, that's the world that we live in. It, it takes us a really long time unless we have the proper tools put in place um, to know that something happened. Now, I feel like that's where we do a really good job and you know, it's unfortunate sometimes where we actually, you know, John Everett, one of our security analysts, he's sitting in the back of the room, you know, he'll find something and he'll send it off to a customer and it's not necessarily the customer's been breached, they might have an infected machine at that point in time, but we're doing our due diligence and we're able to pick that stuff off and we're able to let you as customers know that there's something going on so it doesn't turn into something bigger. Um, top industries, public, healthcare, education, um, financial, a lot of times it's, it's public companies and healthcare. Um, education has actually risen up the ranks a little bit and the, re and the reason being is actually um, they're going for education because a lot of the education, they do not do, do a very good job in not picking on anybody here from a K through 12 or university standpoint of protecting the PII of the people that are there. And this happens a lot of times for K through 12. They're going after kids or children's social security numbers. Does anybody know why they would be doing that? Yeah, there's, there's no, you can't run a credit report on a kid. So what they do is they take those social security numbers, they flip that into a different identity, and off the races they go. And it's unfortunate because sometimes you may, may be 18, 19 years old and you go to apply for your first loan to get a car or something and you have no credit because somebody took all that. That's the reason why education is rising up the ranks because they're going into those databases and pulling out those uh, social security numbers and they're turning that into identity for other people. It, it's, it's really sad. Frequency of malware vectors, here it is, email. Uh, malware types, um, office files, executables. Don't, don't email executables, don't allow, don't allow that to happen. Um, there's Dropbox, there's OneDrive, all this stuff now. Just, just don't email that stuff anymore. Um, that's it. I know I raced through the last couple of slides, but a lot of that stuff I talked about. Um, the, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, I, I'm super pleased with the team that we have uh, right now. I feel like we've grown so much probably just even in the last 14 months on a lot of efficiency standpoint operationally on what we're doing to try to make our service that much better for you. What I'm really excited about, though, is that we have other offerings now. So us as an organization, we can help you with your layered defense. And I'm really big on layered defense, uh, network segmentation. If you read some of our blog articles that I put out there, it's layering that defense so that um, you have something at the gateway, which is the firewall. We can do that. We have something in the cloud for email. We can help you with that. We have endpoint control. We can help you with that. It's just all about the layers that's going on. We have the wireless, we have the switching. You know, I know a lot of people in the office hate me right now, but um, Kevin Roberts helps me out, he takes a lot of this burden, but I have our office locked down now where you can't come in and plug anything in on our network unless you talk to me or you talk to Kevin. And if you unplug yourself and you plug yourself back in, you just took yourself offline. Um, but from a security perspective, that allows us to keep anybody from walking in our offices and plugging anything in without talking to an administrator. And we can do that with the Aerohive switching from a cloud management perspective um, it's a really big deal for us and we get a lot of good analytics, but I'm really excited um, to be able to present this stuff to you, to show you that we have a full service package now and 
We've been working on that stuff for 16 years, and we don't take any of the products that we're, we're supporting lightly. Thanks, everybody.